Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia, for this very interesting introduction. I would like to continue uh, talking about this topic of adaptation mitigation synergies. And I would like to, um, uh, in eight minutes, to, to discuss what we have done uh, in FTA regarding this topic and how we could uh, make this topic evolve uh, in the future. So, uh, as you know, or as you may know, um, there are three uh, teams under the flagship four, uh, the flagship on climate change in FTA. We have one team on mitigation, <coughs> one on adaptation, and one on synergies between adaptation and mitigation. So we have worked on this uh, for a few years, and uh, also with ECRAF and uh, other colleagues, we have uh, developed uh, some research on the links between adaptation and mitigation in global funding, the climate change funding, uh, national policies, local projects, policy network at different scales from local to, to national, and also in, in, in science, to, to understand what, what, uh, what the science says about the links between adaptation and mitigation. So I would like to uh, use some narratives that we found in the, in the literature or when talking to stakeholders at the national or international or even local scale about why and how to link adaptation and mitigation. So the first narrative that uh, we found very often is that people say that land use activities can easily provide adaptation and mitigation benefit together. So it's, it's a very common uh, narrative uh, among donors and uh, project developers. So you have this perception that synergies are automatic. And some people say that if I plant a tree, I will have adaptation benefits. For instance, I will protect the watershed for uh, reducing the vulnerability of water users downstream. And at the same time, I will store carbon. So I will have automatically adaptation and mitigation benefits. But in fact, when you look at the literature, you find a lot of trade-offs between adaptation and mitigation. You find examples of red projects increasing the vulnerability of people. You find uh, examples of adaptation projects increasing emissions. So it's a lot about trade -offs. So we have to move away from this narrative of automatic synergies. We have to highlight trade-offs, especially because it's part of our theory of change. We want, to, uh, we want the decision makers to recognize and uh, manage these trade-offs. Then another very common narrative is that Red Plus needs adaptation. And we, we had some donors saying that uh, mitigation or Red uh, won't work without adaptation. They said this because they believe that um, we need to take into account adaptation to climate change to increase the resilience of Red, pro red Project to, to the changes in the climate and also to increase the legitimacy of, uh, of carbon project because mitigation is driven by global interest while adaptation is driven by local interest. So uh, it's a good point, but at the same time, um, many project developers um, have a different view. They say that adaptation to climate change is not so important because you have so many uh, um, current stressors that are more important to deal with uh, like uh, economic changes or uh, uh, social changes that are more important in the, in the current situation than climate change. And also some, some people say that we need to look at the broader picture and not only uh, uh, adaptation and mitigation. And for instance, um, uh, rather than talking about adaptation and including adaptation into red, we should uh, broaden the discourse to uh, the human pressures on forest, poverty issues, uh, red safeguards, and, uh, and also not only adaptation to climate change. So uh, that's why I think there is a, a, a need to uh, ma making this uh, topic evolve from synergies between mitigation and adaptation to a, a broader view of resilience of uh, social ecological systems to multiple stresses. Then uh, another narrative uh, is that we, we need uh, an integrated approach. We have many donors saying that the integration of adaptation and mitigation will increase in the future. And uh, so these this donors perceive the benefits of uh, an integrated approach. Uh, they also perceive the barriers that uh, prevent them to do it now. So as they say also that um, the, cl the climate funds uh, are going that way. 
to more integration between adaptation and mitigation instead of having separate stream of finance. So we need to explore uh, at what level we need to uh, mainstream this integration of adaptation and mitigation. It's not about funding only. It can be at the national level, uh, at the local level, in, in policy, in, in, in practice. And we also need to uh, explore the different processes that we, uh, we could promote to uh, facilitate this integration without forcing a marriage between adaptation and mitigation. So this is also part of the theory of change. We need to identify where to, to act on this, uh, on this integration. And I also think that uh, we are now in a, in a situation where we are changing discourses in terms of adaptation versus mitigation. The logical um, discourse will be that if I am vulnerable to climate change, or if my sector, my agriculture is vulnerable, I have to adapt. But you see more often people saying, I am vulnerable, so I have to adapt and mitigate. So I think there is a change in, in the way people engage in a voluntary um, commitment to reduce their emissions. Okay, two minutes. So then from the narrative, I want to discuss very quickly, so in, in two minutes, uh, I think that's it. Um, the, I, I may have maybe one more minute because she said eight to nine, and in the program it's ten, so. Um, <laughs> yeah, negotiating. So uh, in the framing that we have used so far uh, in FTA, we uh, used this dichotomy, dichotomy between adaptation and mitigation which is logical because it's uh, the way uh, it has been framed in negotiations in the IPCC with the two different reports or working group on adaptation and mitigation. And of course, uh, it's logical because uh, adaptation and mitigation have different rationals, different temporal and spatial scales, and they share the same ultimate objective to respond to climate change. So we think that it's important that all stakeholders understand this dichotomy, but in fact they don't. And it's, even after uh, so many years uh, uh, working with this uh, dichotomy, you realize that uh, many stakeholders still uh, get confused with the difference between adaptation and mitigation. So the communication on this uh, can become very academic, abstract, and also when you talk to people in disaster risk uh, reduction community, for them, uh, the word they use for, uh, I mean, when they use the word mitigation, it means adaptation for us. It's a lot of confusion in the field. So um, this framing is kind of uh, 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 restrictive, and uh, it's also contributes to this separation between adaptation and mitigation that we criticize. So, for instance, we, we could use a more um, continuous view, especially when we talk about ecosystem services. Uh, very quickly here, we have the services that are related to, to adaptation and mitigation with, at the top, carbon, being purely mitigation, and then other services more at the local level, being more uh, adaptation, clearly. But in between, you have some like the regional climate regulation that's not really adaptation, neither mitigation. So, Maybe it's better to see it as a continuum of services that a landscape can provide for, uh, for climate change. Finally, the last framing I want to discuss is about win-win situations. When we say that <coughs> we work on adaptation, mitigation, synergy, we have a kind of two-dimension uh, approach. So it's better for adaptation, or it's good for adaptation, but bad for mitigation. So win-win or win-lose, um, so it's very simplistic because we have so many dimensions in, uh, in adaptation and mitigation that we need to go beyond this, uh, this, this two dimension. And so uh, to go uh, beyond the, the, the main uh, problems that I have uh, uh, identified, I think we could uh, uh, start working more on the landscape scale and uh, trying to see how to manage landscape for the three objectives of, uh, of, of climate smart landscapes. So first, having landscapes, uh, providing services that are uh, useful for reducing the vulnerability of society to multiple stressors, so it's adaptation services. Then also uh, managing landscape to provide mitigation services, and finally uh, to manage landscape for improving ecological resilience. Okay, thank you.